So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we're here to discuss banking and digital asset growth together with Joseph Seibert, uh, the Managing Group Director and Senior Vice President of Digital Asset Banking uh, at Signature Bank, as well as Eyal Moshe, the CEO and co-founder of Tel Aviv-based cybersecurity firm, Hub Security. Uh, we'll start our webinar with a brief introduction to our speakers. Hello, Eyal. Uh, and then I'll hand over the stage to, to Eyal Moshe and Joseph Seibert for the presentations. And at the end, like I said, we'll hold a short Q&A to wrap everything up. So if you have any questions um, as the discussion is going on, feel free to just, to just, uh, you know, to just uh, write them and, uh, and to send them to us. If you can't find the Q&A, the chat works as well. Um, so I'm joined now by Joseph Seibert. Hi, how are you? Great. Um, in his role as Signature Bank, Seibert oversees all aspects of uh, private client commercial banking related to fiat settlement uh, for cryptocurrency and blockchain technology firms that are trading digital assets. Um, from OTC desk to cryptocurrency exchanges to crypto mining operations, uh, Signature Bank's digital assets team manages most of the day-to-day -day needs of its global clientele. Um, so most recently, Joseph served as vice president and uh, market sales manager at Metropolitan Commercial Bank in Manhattan, and before that, held roles as vice president at Valley National Bank and Bank of America. In 2014, he pivoted a bit and uh, to the digital asset banking space and quickly realized that the digital asset industry needed a, a, a more defined path uh, to successfully merge its clientele with uh, the commercial banking industry. So welcome, Joseph. We're really happy to have you here. Thank you. Excited to be here. Appreciate you showing me. And we're also joined here by Yal Moshe, CEO and co-founder of Hub Security. Yal is the co-founder um, of Hub, uh, which is a military-grade hardware cybersecurity firm um, built by uh, XIDF 8200 unit security experts. I think that's the best way to put it. Um, he is also a former executive at a CA Software, uh, heading a division and um, of their of their. Uh, of their branch and the co-founder of Bling.gy and Planet Soho. Welcome, Eyal. Thank you. Um, so I think I'll first hand over the stage to Joseph, who will share with us his thoughts and insights on digital asset banking. And then we'll hear a bit from um, Eyal on why security is so critical when it comes to protecting digital assets. Um, I think this will be more of a, a discussion. So yeah, feel free to jump in if you know if you want to to add to anything that Joseph is um, is uh, saying and um, and vice versa. Um, and like I said, one more time, if you have questions, uh, drop them in the Q and A, and we will get to them at the end. Um, so take it away, Joseph. Sure. Thank you. So again, thank you to the Hub Security team, Yao, everybody. Uh, for allowing me to speak today. It's exciting times, especially for this uh, industry and really for banking in general, uh, as we see a lot of pivoting towards digital assets and, and speeding up payments uh, here in the US and, and around the globe. So uh, again, my name is Joseph Seibert. I'm the Senior Vice President Managing Group Director for Signature Bank based in Manhattan, uh, a top 40 bank in the US publicly traded uh, in excess of 60 billion in assets and really the largest crypto-friendly bank uh, in, in the U.S. that operates globally. So really an important an initiative uh, to coming to Signature was the aspect that we were going to be global and crypto-friendly. And what that means really, uh, the definition of digital asset banking is simply banking the institutional firms that are underbanked. You know, everyone in this space knows it's very hard to not only obtain a bank relationship, but to maintain it. Uh, there's so many uh, green light, red light stops and goes from banks that are issued to firms that settle USD and foreign currency. It's important to have an institution that's going to be in this for the long term, invest resources, and really important to have an executive management team that has the vision and the courage to, to push forward in this space, not only for U.S. companies, but for companies in Asia, Europe, uh, really any jurisdiction that, that has the need that we are uh, comfortable, you know, with, with operating in. So, you know, with that said, when you really look at uh, digital asset banking uh, over the last six years, uh, since I've entered the space, it's slowly creeping towards adoption 
uh, more so in the U.S. than it has been, but it's really heavily uh, concentrated overseas right now. So our main focal point was how do we deliver something that speaks the language of this community, speeds up payments, you know, promotes growth, promotes all the things that are necessary, cash management services, the ability to open accounts without having to visit your branches, you know, and, and really base it on a model that allows firms that operate, truly operate globally to function properly. So a signature, you know, one of the key aspects for us was, you know, we're, we built this balance sheet on organic growth, you know, funding traditional companies with loans, whether it was real estate or business to business. And we really have a, an executive management team that looks at each industry as a whole and says, how do we become the specialty bank in that space? So really we uh, came to Signature with the high hopes that we had a balance sheet to grow the omnibus banking for our digital asset exchanges, onboard their counterparties, and then come up with a tool that allowed them to settle instantly. So most banks aren't friendly to this space. So as you convert USD to British pounds or euros, you'll find that the bank overseas will kick the funds back, say that they are not supporting the space uh, and really make it clunky and difficult to settle uh, Bitcoin trading. And, and it, it, it's a shame because there's so many opportunities to really lend a helping hand. Most banks are shying away. And I feel it's because of the resources lack thereof and really the lack of vision and executive management support. And that's what Signature Bank has brought to the table. You know, we really have uh, invested a lot of resources, most notably the intelligence to support these resources, the security, which we'll get into later. Um, but mostly we needed something, again, to, to speed up payments. So we launched uh, Signet. So Signet is our own proprietary blockchain based payments platform to settle USD instantly 24 seven, 365. And some of you may be familiar with the platform. If you're not, you can, you can go to signet.com to give you a quick overview, but essentially it's a, it's a protocol that's influenced off the Ethereum blockchain. It's a private permissioned blockchain that we control the power. We control, uh, you know, everything that goes on functionality wise. And we partnered with a, a firm called Tacit here in New York City. Uh, shout out to my good friend, Nick Goodrich, who has, has been a really important partner at Tacit. Uh, they control the nodes for our blockchain and continue to help us with the wallet management and, uh, and, and really make this a product that we can use for years and years and years to come. And again, the reason we chose this was a lot of banks have an archaic infrastructure where you have two operating platforms to choose from, FIS or FISA. So larger banks are really a get in line type procedure when it comes to enhancing that platform or adding services and products for their clients. We wanted to build something that we can control, that we can enhance on the spot and not have to get in line and wait uh, you know, for the resources to either be deployed to our institution or uh, the timeline just not meeting our needs. So with this, blockchain based payments platform, again, being that it's permissioned in private, it's a walled garden. So you have to be onboarded as a client of Signature Bank, which then allows us to follow all the BSA guidelines set forth by, by the government and really follow protocols that are true to banking, yet allow the clients to operate with the speed of payment processing at 3 a.m. on a Saturday on a bank holiday, such as this past week on Labor Day. Uh, we saw, you know, nine figures moving on Signet, you know, over a 24 hour period. Um, these volumes are over, you know, a span of the last year and a half growing exponentially by the day. And it's really dependent upon the ecosystem. So as you know, cryptocurrency firms, the ecosystem is very tight knit. Uh, they are very happy to refer the counterparties they do the most business with to make settlement a faster and more efficient tool for them as they trade Bitcoin. And, and our philosophy is we don't want to custody Bitcoin, right? We're a bank. We have clients that do that really well. Um, I'll briefly mention, you know, the OCC announcing banks can custody is a great news and big win for the space. And as you see, there hasn't been a mad rush of banks going to do it. I think everyone's kind of looking at it. We don't view it as a very profitable uh, initiative at the moment that may change down the road. But if you look at it again, we have clients that custody crypto very well. 
So we thought let's partner with some of those firms and build them an API functionality to settle both sides of the trade instantly and, and really eliminate third party risk. That's also what Signet does. So you may see, uh, have seen some, some recent press releases. Uh, we've partnered with Fireblocks, some, some other custody platforms, uh, another firm, Prime Trust, where we really link our API, share our platform knowledge, and let them speak to each other as to really eliminate, again, that third party risk and allow these clients to operate efficiently when it comes to movement of USD, foreign currency, and Bitcoin. Now, right now, Signet supports USD only, but our, our goal and our mission is to speed up payment processing all around the world. Uh, so when it comes to euros, pounds, yen, you name it, uh, it's clunky, it's inefficient, it's expensive. Our platform is free of charge. We do not charge transaction fees. We don't charge monthly fees. We don't charge any fees to use Signet. It settles in under 25 seconds. Sometimes you can catch the blockchain in that five to 10 second range, and there's no limit. You can send a hundred million dollars or a dollar. doesn't matter what time of day or night, you're not going to need to get authorization from your bank. You set up the controls in your firm. You allow your users to input, approve, just like you would a normal bank account. And you can execute these transactions free of charge and, and really at a speed that's unheard of at this day and age in banking. Uh, and the reason we want to do that again is really to, to speak the language and make sure people had a tool to use for years to come. When you have an internal bank system that controls all the payments, you're reliant upon the Fed Swift wire window or the banking hours in general. We've eliminated that. We actually turned Signature Bank into a 24 seven bank, literally overnight, about two and a half years ago when my team arrived here. Um, you know, our team really started with three or four individuals, has grown to 14 this year. We've just been here for a little under three years and have built a massive ecosystem. And we're really proud of that. And I think a lot of our clients know that what sets us apart is we are responsive, uh, we are diligent, which are two very key factors in this space. You have to be responsive. And that doesn't mean during our eight hour work window or 11 hour work window, their work window. So they're deploying labor overnight to meet US banking needs. It's our responsibility to reply and to get their needs met at two, 3 a.m. So we have an overnight support team that also is there to face all the challenges you may encounter when you're trying to tee up wires or send signets. Um, and to back up a little more, you know, signets are simply tokens. So again, we have a closed blockchain. So what it is is one to one representation of USD. So all your USD that's in your bank account at Signature can be pushed onto Signet. We then hold it in our Omnibus account on our balance sheet, safe and secure. And we represent that digitally in the form of what's called the Signet token. And that's how those tokens move. Uh, you know, and, then, and that's how you can send monies to other firms that are operating in this space and vice versa. Uh, so really that's what it does and that's what it's meant to do. But it's also a walled garden approach where we're in control of the funds. You know, so if there is an issue, we can always look at the wallets that are interacting. It's not going outside the walled garden. We can pretty much understand and know where that transfer has gone to. And, uh, and that, again, is so important in this day and age because, you know, people prioritize how uh, they do business with, with regards to payments. And I think a lot of banks want to be in blockchain, but as our, our CEO, Joe DiPaolo says, you have to be in blockchain. And if you're not as a bank, he believes inside of five years, you'll be gone as a bank. And, and that may hold true on his timeline. It may be even sooner, but that's why Signature Bank decided to really step up, invest resources and build Signet uh, really for worldwide adoption, not just US adoption. Uh, we also were unique in a way where Signature Bank was the first US bank that gained regulatory approval for such a pro uh, project and, and platform. Uh, a lot of FinTech firms have built payment platforms uh, that use payment processors, but for a bank to do it was unheard of. And we did beat JP Morgan to the punch. As, as many of you know, JP Morgan released their coin project in, in early 2019. We launched Signet in December of 2018, uh, mm -hmm. only after 11 months of starting the project. Tacit was, was excellent on, on delivering the initiative uh, to market. 
And uh, NYDFS, which is the New York Department of Financial Services, our primary regulator, uh, launched a uh, press release approving this platform. So we really were able to merge the US compliant regulatory aspect with the banking aspect. And, and that was something our chairman is really proud of, our CEO is really proud of, and we continue to work closely with the NYDFS today so they can understand the space better. You know, when we think of this space growing, we need U.S. retail and institutional adoption. Uh, Fidelity entered the space as a custodian agent. Excellent news. All the institutions that are now investing heavily in Bitcoin here in the U.S., big news, exciting. And I think that'll push the market to retail adoption over time. But from the banking perspective, you know, we have a pretty good head start here at Signature on, on what we want to do with this ecosystem. Uh, continue to bank the underbanked case by case. You know, you, you still have to be approved for a relationship to get on to Signet. But the important aspect is we have a big bank that's willing to take the challenge on, spend the money to, to enhance the services and features we, we provide now and continue to add and, and, and the ability to grow in this space. Uh, and, and that's a functionality that you just don't see in other banks. Um, or the bank is too small or doesn't have the executive team that supports it. So uh, with that said, I mean, I, I have a lot more to share. I want to see if there's any questions in the interim or if there's any other topics you want to pursue, but uh, that's a quick high level overview of the bank, uh, my career path and, and what Signet does today. Uh, Joseph, I actually have a question for you. Um, uh, could you elaborate on what separates uh, Signature Bank from its competition in the digital asset uh, banking space? Uh, sure. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, many, many people ask me that same question every day. And uh, my first response is we're, we're extremely responsive as a unit and being truly 24 seven. So it's one thing to say, I'll answer an email at 1130 and go to bed. No, our team is there overnight. So again, if you're in multiple time zones, Australia, Singapore, you name it, London, we're going to get back to you. You may not see it until your workday starts, but just trust in knowing that that deliverable is going to be met within a 24 hour span. And our balance sheet, you know, being a publicly traded you know, bank here in the US uh, with, a, with a large balance sheet really supports our, our digital exchanges. As you know, they're holding a lot of client funds, you know, they're, they're holding them in omnibus. They, they were apprehensive to put those funds on a small balance sheet because of the security of that bank. Um, especially before some of the smaller banks became public, uh, there was a concentration risk, you know, especially with regulatory framework in the US, you cannot be over concentrated with certain clients. We don't have that problem here. And, and it's, it's really nice to be able to sell that feature saying, you can trust us because we are public, we have a balance sheet and you're always gonna know that those financial records are public and that you can see our earnings calls and, and, and you can see how the bank's doing from a growth perspective. But our, our chairman, our CEO, our vice chairman have been so supportive. That might be my number one reason why we're being uh, aggressive in this space and so successful. We have the leadership that has the vision to accelerate our growth and invest resources in, and they're really behind us. And that's been the biggest driver and difference. Great, that's uh, truly enlightening. I have a kind of a follow-up question. Uh, uh, maybe it's more like a, a brainstorm. I was wondering uh, to pick your brain on what, what are your thoughts around uh, the mass adaptation of, of you know, utilizing cryptocurrencies in the US. Um, uh, maybe you have some thoughts on timeline as well. Sure, another, another great question. I mean, if you look at today's timeline, I think we're, we're well behind here in the US what Europe and Asia has adopted. Uh, and that's a retail problem. Um, if you note a Forbes press release uh, on, on the JP Morgan coin and our coin, um, we, we noted that it was important to understand our bank didn't want to become the Venmo platform. So our focal point right out of the gates was institutional firms. We promised our regulators that we would walk before we run because there's no regulatory framework here. So I feel that mass retail adoption won't occur until regulatory framework is built. And that's probably about two and a half years from now, we hope sooner, but you're starting to see institutional firms dabble in investments, you know, larger hedge funds, 
uh, Fidelity becoming a custody agent is huge news. And uh, so you're seeing signs of life. And until the regulatory framework is built, I don't think you'll see the ability to take uh, payment at most retail stores in Bitcoin. But I do, I do see that day coming. And I see it coming, you know, like our CEO said, before five years, which he stated two years ago. So we're hoping two and a half to three years, and we're hoping uh, the regulatory framework is built, and then I think you'll see U.S. adoption occur. And then all the banks will jump in, which yep. is late to the party, but it, it'll be good news. And, you know, that kind of made me think about uh, FDIC and, and secure deposits and, and, you know, how would that uh, uh, evolve in your, in your uh, vision? Uh, yeah, so, you know, the unique feature, again, with Signet is uh, your, your, your deposits insured. You know, there are, are the standard FDIC limits of 250000 for tax ID. However, when you put your money into the bank, you, you still have that security of knowing that that deposit's insured. That translates over to Signet. Because, again, that money is held in an omnibus account on a balance sheet. It's just a digital representation of your monies in right. the Signet. So the FDIC, which is also another regulator of ours, is always concerned with how we're functioning as a bank and, and what type of classifications we have, what kind of rules we have in place. And we have such a thorough due diligence process uh, during our onboarding. And if some clients are listening now, you're probably shaking your head. Yes, you know, sometimes it's taken many weeks to get onboarded, but we've sped that process up by asking the right questions. You know, at first we asked, I think, too many questions. And a lot of them were around deposits. Are they insured? Do you get past their insurance? We, we've developed a way now to help our exchanges that have large omnibus accounts get past their FDI insurance, FDIC insurance on their omnibus accounts that are holding all these pooled client funds. That was a big step for us. Uh, but again, being a top 40 bank publicly traded in the US with the FDIC as a primary regulator, it pushes us to make sure we're following all these protocols and, and it won't change. So, you know, there's another uh, added advantage where if you have a bank that might be smaller and not publicly traded, are your deposits safe? You know, you have to ask that question and that goes for anywhere, you know, but especially in the US, you know, I think banks are shy from jumping in. So for us, it's a huge win to have a bank this size uh, open its doors. Sure. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, and the last the last thing that comes to mind is uh, maybe you can share uh, some of your thoughts on the roadmap for Signet. Uh, yeah. Or 2021. Or so most recently, and uh, again, thank you. That's a great question. Uh, we launched an API, a REST API on Signet. Um, why do we do that? So. We want our exchanges to be able to fill their order books instantly. We want our exchanges to be able to connect with custody platforms and, and, and really speed up every aspect of this transaction. But it also, you don't want to deploy manual labor to do manual things, right? You, you need an API. Uh, we're looking to enhance that API, uh, add more features and functionality. Uh, we're looking at increasing our ecosystems, not only on the crypto side, it's already a very large ecosystem, but on traditional banking. You know, we launched with a company called American PowerNet, which is based in Pennsylvania. Uh, when we launched Signet, they were our first traditional client to adopt Signet um, renewable energy. So industries like that, um, cargo sprint, there's so many, there's so much need for faster payments to move money around the world instantly. So we're looking at uh, expanding our product offering on Signet, <coughs> continuing to invest resources make it better, uh, enhance security, you know, and uh, add FX, you know, and I could say we don't have an exact timeline for that, but we're hopeful in 2021, we'll be able to hold multi-currencies on Cigna. So it wouldn't just be USD. We're looking to hopefully have Canadian dollar, pounds, euros, yen, have a whole plethora of options so that we get rid of this clunky FX trading market uh, that, that's really getting in the way. You know, if you really I'm look at the right definition, Amazing, you know, we've all figured out how to use Bitcoin and move money through stable coins like Tether and USDC, but we can't figure out how to send euros in three days. You know, it's, it's, it's a shame. So we're hopeful that that 
um, is, is on, it's on our roadmap. We're hopeful it gets executed next year. Well, I'm, I'm done with questions. I had a lot of them uh, we didn't get to cover. Uh, maybe we can get some questions from the audience. Sure. Uh, we have one. Yeah, I would love to also, Yal, hear a bit from you about um, your take on the cybersecurity landscape um, when it comes to digital assets and, and digital banking. Do you have a few, maybe a few insights you want to share with us before we jump into Q&A? Yeah, of course. So, um, so uh, the last thing that uh, Joseph mentioned was uh, the cyber risks and, and uh, security risks. So I, I want to um, maybe uh, emphasize and talk a little bit about uh, what we're seeing as the major risks and uh, then we can touch base on how we look at them here at uh, Hub Security. Uh, so I think the main, uh, one of the main concerns, and this is not, not a secret, um, uh, stealing the keys is a big concern, stealing the private keys, uh, even on separate networks, we've, we've seen uh, 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 things happen. Uh, the issue of identity, uh, stealing the identity. I think uh, most of the uh, people here have seen, uh, there was a famous story about a German, um, uh, a German uh, CEO that uh, some hacker used uh, deep fake to mimic his voice. And these are things that you can basically get pretty much for free with your phone. Uh, uh, I'm talking about deep fakes that are very uh, much advanced right now. And you can mimic your voice, your video, your appearance. Um, so stealing an identity has become extremely easy and almost uh, anywhere between cheap and cost nothing. And that's a, that's a huge concern. And we're also seeing um, the issue of hijacking data, um, which basically uh, goes down to what you see is what you sign. And the things that you see on screen is not necessarily representing the reality. Uh, these are also things that we're, uh, uh, we're seeing um, in the, um, in the in the internet and and you know um, looking and analyzing uh, hacks, so these are, these are things that uh, they are showing uh, showing up. So uh, going back to hub security and what we've done here, and maybe I'll give a little bit of background into who we are and and what we do. Um, so hub security has been um, has been uh, up and running since uh, 2017. Uh, we're a group of uh, highly experienced uh, um, executives. Uh, most of the team here uh, came from uh, the NSA of Israel, units uh, called 8200 and other code names that are maybe uh, uh, less uh, famous or less uh, familiar. And these are people that has been working for uh, the state of Israel, uh, protecting its uh, uh, most valuable secrets for decades. And the idea was to see how we can bring uh, that experience to our clients and to the market. And I think that the main thing that we look at is how do we keep a secret? How do we manage it? Uh, and these days with COVID, uh, how do you manage it remotely? How do you deal with uh, your identity remotely? Um, and still there are a lot of flexibilities that needs to be adjusted because of this period uh, in time. And these are things that uh, we've taken into, uh, into our platform um, as, a key, um, as a key ingredient. So talking about the um, uh, protecting the keys and the identity, which is the prime, uh, the prime, prime message for us uh, at Hub Security. Uh, we've built a very unique architecture where it is, um, it's really safe and, uh, you know, once clients get uh, to interact with us, we share, um, we share some reports and, uh, 
And you can also find that on our website. Uh, that we have companies that uh, uh, have tried um, to, uh, you know, utilize and, and, and use our, uh, our platform in various ways. And uh, the, the level of uh, protection we provide is as high as it gets. Um, now, the, the, deal, the deal with uh, managing those fees remotely is something that COVID introduced to us and, uh, and it's a challenge. And the fact that uh, there are some solutions with splitting keys or splitting uh, the physical um, uh, representation of a key or parts of a key while legally you can't go to an office or anywhere um, to, uh, you know, to actually uh, go there and, and, and uh, execute a transaction is something that we've thought um, pretty uh, thoroughly about. And we've introduced uh, as part of, as a key uh, part of our, um, of our platform, uh, uh, a product called Vini HSM. Uh, and HSM, uh, as I'm sure most of the people here uh, are aware of, an HSM is a hardware security module where it basically keeps the keys, it generates the keys inside um, a secure enclave. They never go out. Uh, it is impossible to reach them. And part of uh, our uh, perception into how do you, uh, how do you interact uh, and how do you approve uh, transactions or identity remotely is with the same architecture as, uh, as your, you know, your, your DHSM that sits in your data center in your bank's vault, uh, but with a, a smaller unit that uh, can basically, is basically holding the same architecture and will allow you to interact with your data center in a highly secure way. And these are things that have been uh, implemented on a state level um, we're, when we're saying it's a, it's a, it's a military grade, uh, solution that is, uh, uh, a key component to that statement. These, uh, methodologies have been embraced by states and, uh, they're not so easy to get to. Um, so this is something that, uh, uh requires some more, uh, thinking and, and, uh, and, uh, knowledge and experience, uh, which we have here at Hub Security. Um, I think another uh, key element. Yeah, I wanted to maybe just um, get to some of the, we have lots of questions pouring in and I just wanna make sure that we have enough time to get to all of them. Um, because, yeah. because we have a super engaged audience and um, okay. maybe it'd be uh, helpful for the- I'll wrap up, I'll wrap up very, uh, very soon. So I think that um, the last point that I want to uh, talk about is the fact that uh, with our platform, one of the key elements, which is uh, an approval flow or who is going to be the admin for the process of approving a transaction. Um, I can give you a, a, a really quick example. Uh, and we're all, you know, we all, uh, know about the famous hack uh, from Binance. Uh, there was also a very famous hack uh, to a traditional bank um, in Malta uh, last year. And those hacks both happened kind of in a similar way. Uh, those hacks happened when the hackers uh, got into uh, the bank system or you know the, the exchange system and they were able to change the rules and the uh, admin access uh, and not necessarily to reach the keys. And uh, one of the main things that we're doing uh, at Op Security is we're also securing uh, the admin process of how do you deal with the rules, how do you manage the rules, and how do you interact between the users of your own system. And this is also something that uh, uh, we are uh, looking at this as uh, any other transaction, and we're keeping all the rules of uh, the organization uh, inside uh, the HSM, inside the secure enclave of the HSM. And this is, uh, we've seen in the market, this is a, a very powerful tool that is being used uh, uh, quite a lot. And I think uh, the, the, last, um, the last note that I have is that um, the fact that we're 
building the entire stack here uh, and we control uh, the entire flow uh, gives us uh, the ability to be very flexible in terms of the solutions. Uh, and that's why we were able to adjust, uh, you know, to, to, to rapid uh, business changes uh, through the pandemic. Uh, and, and I think uh, the, the, the time of the pandemic proved that uh, uh, pretty strongly. So that's, uh, that is, I think, my last note. Uh, I really think that uh, cyber risks should be taken extremely seriously. Uh, especially when we're uh, when we're going to enter um, the space of regulation, and you know, when when the focus starts to go there, uh, regulation will start to operate. It looks like uh, it has already begun, and uh, we're looking uh, forward for the challenge for the challenge. Great. Thank you so much, Jaya. And yeah, I definitely think that there uh, needs to be a broader discussion on the cybersecurity implications of working with digital assets and uh, protecting um, protecting uh, tokens, and um, especially when it comes to to digital banking. Um, okay, I'm just going to jump in. We have a few questions here, and I'll start with with the first one. I think, um, which I find uh, pretty pretty interesting. Um, Timothy is asking if that's a signet painting in the back, um, in the back of you, behind you, Joseph. And if it is, it's, a, it says it's brilliant. Um, it is a uh, signet, that's, that's our symbol for one signet token. And we had a, a company out of uh, Wisconsin make the canvas art for us. Um, so I have a few in my office, one at home. Um, yeah, it's 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 a it's a logo we've come up with to identify uh, a token, and we're we're pretty happy how it came out. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, it, it reminds me of um, the secret logo. I don't know if you know this book. Um, yeah. Um, okay, great. Thanks for uh, thanks for that question, Timothy. Um, we have here um, Gregory Swank is asking. Um, saying thanks for your vision, um, he, you know, he means in a signature bank's vision. What sort of pushback um, have you experienced from regulators um, when building, uh, building the, the, the company? Less pushback on what we're doing, more pushback on uh, their knowledge of the space, right? So a lot of the field auditors they deploy to banks uh, are green to the space, and after they become educated, may move on to other things. And then we're, we're almost re-explaining everything that we've done for the last two and a half years. But the leadership team at the regulatory bodies are understandable, they're supportive. So the only primary pushback we've gotten is when we pull the retail market. As a bank, we decided really to not engage in trade activity under 50,000 USD. Uh, we're starting to get more comfortable with that. Uh, but that's the one agreement we had with our regulator when we launched Signet. It would be institutional only. Let's walk the fully run. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question here from Eric, um, one of our attendees. Um, they said, uh, sorry for a bit of a gotcha question, but will you allow your customers to take a note in Signet? No. Not, not on a roadmap. Okay. Great. Um, an anonymous attendee is asking, in a B2B transaction, would the counterparty also need to bank with Signature Bank, uh, or can you um, disperse funds um, to accounts at other banks as well? Yeah, so right now it's uh, internal, so it's B2B for any client that's on board at Signature. That's how we comply with BSA, KYC. We are, believe me, we're thinking heavily about how we can make this work where, uh, yeah, for lack of a better term, let's say Signature is the central bank, right? We want banks to help out and participate on the platform. Uh, we've already, you know, partnered with a few. Uh, we do some side, you know, bar transactions, and it works well, uh, especially if they're overseas. Uh, so for now, you have to be in the walled garden and eventually we hope that that changes but we would need regulatory framework and approval 
for us to, to feel comfortable doing so. Great, thank you. Um, so I think this next question is also for Joseph and I have one for you Eliel, soon coming up. Um, if issues related to cryptocurrencies are so transparent, then why are the regulators slash government resisting acceptance? <laughs> This is a hard question maybe to answer, but it's a question again. hard and long. It's a great question. And I think it's really, again, it comes down to basic knowledge. Uh, when people are afraid of something, they refuse to learn about it. Mm -hmm. if you can make yourself uncomfortable to get comfortable, you'd be surprised how much knowledge you'll gain. And I think that's simply, and, and don't take this the wrong way if there's a regulator listening out there, it, it, it's not an intelligence factor, it's a willingness, right? So let's let's all admit cryptocurrencies are not you know, the, the normal person on the street. You ask them what Bitcoin is, I still do it today, they don't know. You ask someone in Europe or Asia, they'll tell you in two seconds uh, how, how it's controlled, which blockchain you wanna talk about. You know, so mass adoption starts with conversations in coffee shops. It starts with uh, being able to pay for goods and services in Bitcoin. You know, Bermuda, for example, uh, recently is trying to adopt USDC to pay for government taxes and services. It's, it's initiatives like that that get people more knowledgeable. Well, what do you mean I could pay my taxes in Bitcoin? Teach me about it. It's, it's the, the fear of not knowing, so let's ignore it. Uh, so to me, to, to answer that question, I would say education is important around this space and knowing the rails. You got to know how you can operate. Just like if you're on the highway, you got to know the speed limit. Same thing here. You want to know how you can operate. So the SEC should have guidelines. The OCC should have guidelines. And if you notice the OCC just said banks can custody, they've become more comfortable with it. It's just really about knowledge and getting more comfortable with the space and how it works. You know, when this whole initiative started back in 2009 um, and banks were looking at it, they all thought Bitcoin was used to launder money, uh, you know, to sell drugs, Cash is still the number one tool to launder money in this world, cash. And, and I don't know if that'll ever change. Um, but, you know, until people start breaking out of that fear and learning about it, we'll be stuck in neutral. But, but I think it's, we're getting better. Definitely. Uh, I think it's a follow-up to that. The attendee um, asked, uh, further, when cryptocurrency is a medium of exchange, unless the government controls the quantum of issue, they will not be able to control inflation. How do you reconcile the two? I don't know if you can reconcile the two. Uh, you know, I don't know if the U.S. government will ever allow uh, a currency to dominate the U.S. dollar. Uh, you know, I, I think to be used as a means of payment is a really exciting use case, a store of value. You know, people say it's digital gold, but you know, we have to have support. You know, and again. We're so early in that stage that I just don't see it being something where inflation would even come into play. You know, right now, let's talk about stable coins. You look at the value, some days they're less than a dollar. You know, it, it, it's, so, it's so murky. Uh, it's hard to, to really pinpoint, but I think you'll see eventually once you can use it in our society and you go to an antique shop in Maine, you could, you could use Bitcoin. Uh, so that's a good sign. But until you could go into your local grocery store and use it to buy groceries, I don't know if I'll have an answer to that question anytime soon. Right. I mean, and, and that's what crypto, the stable coins like um, Libra you know, from Facebook are trying to do. And, and they're having a very hard time very hard. Um, cutting through the regular regulatory tape. Um, so, so their future is also pretty uncertain. Um, you, okay. So it's pretty hot and heavy. And then all of a sudden, it got to the desk of the U.S. Mm -hmm. Department, and we Send didn't it down. So. Yeah. So we'll see how that goes. Um, okay, so we have a question here. I think this is also for Joseph, um, another one from Timothy. Um, Joe, hmm. how much focus and investment goes into the cybersecurity aspect of managing the network and securing the infrastructure? DDoS by nation states, cyber criminals, and other actors are getting more and more aggressive. How do you instill confidence in clients that your BCNW is secure? Yeah, it's, a, it's another great question, a great point. Uh, mm -hmm. To answer the first part, we spent a lot of time and a lot of resources on this topic. 
We have an entire compliance financial intelligence unit at the bank that, and my CEO will, will not let, let me dive too deep in our protocol, but I can tell you it's an ongoing discussion day by day because, you know, there's so many bad actors out there. And what, you know, to Yao's point, we've seen a, a rash of business email compromise when executing wire transfers. So, and that's been historic in banking. That's been going on for years. We've seen an increased rash of it recently because, you know, if you're sending a wire for $100,000 to buy Bitcoin and you get your Bitcoin and it's in your wallet, adios, you know, well, if you hacked into someone's email and stole their credentials and were able to send that money out, the chances you're getting that money back because you didn't perform the transaction are, are almost 0%. So our main goal and priority is to stop that from happening at the point. And it's so important to know your customer, know who you're dealing with, you know, make sure you follow our list of protocols, which I will keep private. Uh, but we're always looking for ways to enhance security. And I think that's where hub can help. You know, I, banks in general, again, rely on clunky archaic platforms that we have to hopefully enhance with our own resources. Security is not one of those. You know, you can have a corporate security team. You can have any units. You can have personnel dedicated to cybersecurity. You can have all these in place. It's really how do you determine what to focus on first? Identity theft is a big problem. Uh, senior citizen fraud, you know, people taking over senior citizens' computers, telling them, you know, this is their local cable company. You owe us all this back money. And, and the senior doesn't know enough to, to understand what's going on with Bitcoin, their money's gone instantly. So protecting the elderly abuse has been another focal point. And I think our Bitcoin exchanges have been helpful. You know, recently a few of them have installed new security measures where Bitcoin won't leave instantly. You know, your wallet will be frozen. It will be inactive for several days or weeks to prevent any type of unknown uh, you know, source coming in and tapping to your, your credentials. Uh, we all are guilty of it. You send your ID over your phone, you text things, you email things from your phone, you reply all, all this information is floating. So all this data is, is constantly out there. These hackers are smart. They know how to use it and they know how to infiltrate and then they know, they know how to reuse it. And that's the dangerous part. Once they get away from once, they double down and then they keep going. And it's just a, it's a matter of stopping it at the point, uh, but you're going to have to, and, and as a bank, dump a lot of resources in, and time into doing it. And we take it very serious here. And it's one of the major questions we get asked when we get audited by our regulators. Definitely. And I would love to hear Yal um, also, you know, your thoughts on this, obviously working in the cybersecurity space and, you know, working directly with fintechs and with banks, um, you know, to help them secure their assets. Um, I think that you could probably give us a few, um, a few thoughts, but I uh, would just add maybe to what Joseph said and um, you're right, many banks are built on um, outdated legacy systems and um, that are just simply not secure. And I think that um, one of the things that financial institutions will be working to do over the next decade is to prove to, um, to consumers and investors um, that they can tackle uh, the security issues and, and still providing the services um, that are needed to, to process cryptocurrency and to provide digital services. Yeah, so as I think as, uh, as Joseph mentioned, the, the um, let, let's call it by its name, the, the outdated and old systems that are now being used by banks are not really a good fit for um, something so sophisticated as blockchain and I think this is where we're seeing a lot of fracture uh, between those uh, uh, the, the more the, the request the, the need for a more modern approach uh, supporting blockchain and existing banking system which are pretty old uh, and outdated and uh, I think this is part of uh, um, where we kind of play uh, and other players in the cybersecurity space uh, that are in need. Uh, to in some way update uh, the bank infrastructure uh, with some core systems. And just to give you a, a, an example, uh, quantum computing is already a fact in the market and, uh, and hackers are starting to, uh, um, to look into uh, how you can utilize and you can basically buy uh, quantum computing uh, resources from 
the cloud, from IBM, from Google, from, uh, from those players. And these can be easily uh, uh, redirected uh, into uh, hacking, stealing identity, and uh, being reused for, uh, for bad purposes. And uh, this is also something that uh, uh, we thought about, and it's part of our, um, it is a, um, a, a basic portion of, of uh, our platform. Uh, we are quantum, quantum ready. And this is something that we thought about uh, for quite some time for our clients. Uh, so that's, that's another, uh, I think, example um, of how advanced and how uh, forward thinking you need to be in order to try and beat you know, hackers, which are super sophisticated to the punch. Definitely. Okay, I'm going to um, move on to our next question here, because I think that we can talk about this all day. Um, and if you want to find more information, we have um, lots of content on the Hub Security blog uh, discussing these topics about securing digital assets and secure baking. Um, so check that out. Shameless promotion. Um, Eric. Eric is asking, does Signet heavily trade Ethereum? Eric from Switzerland. Does Signet have an H? What were the last two words? Uh, does Signet heavily trade Ethereum? Oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> this isn't like a typical wallet. So it's not a Bitcoin wallet. It's not an Ethereum wallet. It is a private permission blockchain. So only Signets can be settled. So when you're, you're burning and minting a Signet token, it's just a representation of your USD in the wallet. It, we've had... Clients try to send uh, ether, but it, there's there's a uh, called a protocol in place to prevent that because uh, we don't want uh, to accept digital currencies. Because remember, we're not a bank that will custody that. We have clients that will, uh, and you can link up with that uh, custody platform on Signet. But the digital asset would be pushed to their platform. The mm -hmm. fee would be settled. Okay, great. Um, you mentioned uh, Signet is pegged to the U.S. dollar. How do you offer instant transactions to clients outside of the dollar zone? That is a question from Adrian. So we still have the traditional bank rails open. You can do wires and ACH, which again is reliant upon SWIFT and the Fed banking window being open. But the instant settlement is because our blockchain settles, you know, depending on when you catch it, it could be anywhere from five to 25 seconds. So, you know, it's, it's an instant settlement because it's just a Signet token transferring one, one wallet to another, speaking to each other on that platform. If you want to get out of your, you know, Signet wallet and convert back to your, your bank account, you still need to go back to your signature bank account, send your funds to your home bank, which we have a lot of clients do. You know, they'll settle tens of millions of dollars in an afternoon and then take uh, the money out and send it to their parent company in Hong Kong via wire transfer. So the traditional rails are still there. They're still in play. This rail is there for you to use 24 seven. So you don't have to rely on the bank fed window, uh, the bank hours, the fed window to settle your trade activity. You know, you don't want to have to wait a weekend or a bank holiday uh, to get your, your, your trade settled. So that's the design and purpose of it. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question here from a participant, Nitin. Um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I think it's a question that's relevant to both, uh, to both you, Joseph, and Eyal. So I'm just going to throw it out there and we'll see, we'll see who bites. Um, on custody, can you define the difference between storage of private keys versus digital assets themselves? As in case of crypto assets or cryptocurrency, the keys are a claim on assets as opposed to um, an asset that lives on the chain. What does custody mean and regulatory considerations, liquidity and other business considerations? You are doing great at Signet, thanks. I'm gonna share the answer. I mean, I'm gonna share the question if you can see it maybe on the screen because um, it's a bit long-winded, but um, share it in the chat. Um, but I think what they're asking is to define the differences between a storage of private keys versus digital assets themselves, which I think Eyal maybe can help with answering. Um, <sighs> Joseph, you can take it away. I think you had a... Hello? Are you there? Yeah, sorry. Uh, so um, the difference, uh, I think, oh, 
I just I was trying to read uh, in the in the uh, chat um, chat area. So I think uh, um, an easy way to uh, to explain that is that um, the private key is basically your identity, and if your identity holds uh, um, several details like accounts or or uh, or money or whatever it is which is managed by the blockchain um, the identity is the more important part um, and the way you interact with your identity and approve um, this uh, the interaction portion with your identity is a critical one and i think on the banking side uh, joseph can elaborate uh, furthermore yeah, I mean, to that further that point, uh, like I said, when we have, when you think about it from a private key standpoint, the bank controls those, right? So we're in control of the identity of that uh, institution. We have our own um, security protocols in place that are really controlled by Tacit, our, our partner in this uh, effort. But for us, the added security layer comes in on the walled garden approach because we're not custodying, so we're not allowing ourselves to be open to anyone trying to hack and steal Bitcoin out of a, a wallet we're holding, right? Some banks are looking at doing that. You know, they want to be a custody solution, but not a fiat on and off ramp. To me, that's putting the, you know, the cart before the horse, because how can you do one thing if you aren't doing the, the thing you're built for? You know, if you're not selling fiat, you're not a fintech firm, you're a bank. You know, fintech firms are there to help you. They do it much better, but private keys, when you think of Signet, are truly private. You know, you can't uh, essentially uh, obtain that information because it's, uh, it's again, it's a permissioned blockchain as opposed to an open source. Um, so there's a little difference there, but when you think of custodying the digital asset, your security has to be ramped up tenfold. Uh, people are going to try to get that Bitcoin. It's just, you know, look at it today. The value is 10,100 plus per coin. It's pretty significant from where we were in 2010, right? So they're always going to try uh, with, with, of course, with the supply being cut uh, as it was recently this year. The demand's going to go up. Uh, so all these things you have to take into consideration, but the unique thing about security on blockchain is that it's so you know transparent for those running the nodes. Uh, to me, it helps us understand when we see attempts uh, when we see too much data coming in, you ask yourself why. Um, so I think it's an ongoing discussion that uh, is 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 really exciting for a bank like us that are that is already on the fiat side. If we decide to custody, because the OCC is now comfortable with it, I think we'll do our best to learn everything we can about working with companies like Hub and others. Let them do what they do well, and, and you guys, and we'll do what we do well. Once you get into uncharted territory, that's where the hackers see it and they come, adios, and, and the coin's gone. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so I think uh, we want to wrap up. Uh, so I'm just gonna ask a few quick um, final questions. Um, and I think they're interesting, so I want to touch on them before we, we end here. Um, and I think this is directed to Joseph, so please share how you um, incorporate cyber insurance to cover potential losses um, due to, I'm assuming, cybersecurity attacks. Proprietary information. Air, because we're publicly traded, just know that uh, heavily insured. Let's put it there. Okay. Um, okay. Um, what kind of growth has Signet experienced during the past three years? Any impact from COVID-19? Interesting. We've got, our team has become more efficient with COVID. You know, uh, myself, uh, state traveling into Manhattan, once March 17th rolled around, it was really a hot spot at that point. So, you know, we were reporting to brick and mortar offices, um, you know, following our, our normal day and then having our overnight team take over. Now, I can log in at 5 a.m. I can log in at 11 o'clock at night. I can work my own schedule based on volume. And I think our team feels the same way. We've become more efficient during COVID. Uh, digital banking, if you take Bitcoin out of the equation, digital banking has been here for years. Mobile banking was really incepted. Bank of America launched that app in 2004, 2005. 
And people will say, what is this? I don't, I'm not depositing a check on my phone. You know, now, if you can't deposit a check on your phone, you're probably not opening an account with that bank. So think about that, you know, your phone security, what you're doing with that, you know, banks have gotten very comfortable with, with mobile, mobile apps. So we've almost adopted mobile banking from a human perspective during COVID. And all we've done is raise it up a notch to make sure our level of service hasn't dropped off, make sure our responsiveness hasn't dropped off. We, we, we I think, increased efficiency on onboarding, risk, compliance. We've gotten faster and better because you can work around, simply put. It's a shame. I mean, it's a terrible pandemic, but I think a lot of firms, including a lot of uh, digital currency firms, have noticed they can work from home where your CEO may have not had that mindset before. I think that has changed significantly during this past six months. Thanks, Dave. Okay, I think with that, um, that was our final question. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you so much to our speakers, Ian Moshe and Joseph Zivert. And we hope um, that you're all staying safe and healthy at home. Um, and we look forward to hosting many more discussions like these. Um, to learn more about Signature Bank, uh, you can find them on LinkedIn. Um, and to stay up to date on upcoming webinars, you can follow Hub Security um, on LinkedIn or Twitter. And um, you can also check out Hub's Weekly Digest on Medium. It comes out every Thursday um, for the latest stories coming out of the blockchain and crypto sphere. Um, so with that, I'm going to say a, a final thank you. And uh, thank you to everybody uh, who's joining us as well from, from all over the world. Um, we hope you're staying uh, safe and healthy, um, and we hope to see you next week. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Thank you.